So then, a um, very quick side to the agenda, so where I'm hitting you today. So I will uh, provide a, a short company presentation, then give you some uh, insight of the technical features of our CBAC recovery solutions, talking about some reference projects we have done in, in the cement business, and then uh, I will broaden uh, uh, the, the view, giving, uh, sharing with you also our experience about uh, other heat recovery projects in steel, glass, and other and other business. Uh, uh, taking the chance to, to talk about uh, these uh, um, European-funded uh, uh, HR uh, EII demo project, and then to wrap up with some uh, conclusions. So, <coughs> uh, very briefly, who is to bother? Boden is a 30 year, years old company which uh, uh, produces and, and develops uh, RC power plants only. So we, we just do RC uh, systems. Uh, as said, uh, we are 30, 30 years old and we have uh, uh, therefore quite a big experience in this specific product in, which makes us uh, being the European leader for this, uh, for this uh, industrial product. In 2009, uh, the majority of our company was bought by uh, um, the Power System, which is a uh, which is uh, it's a controlled by UTC company, which is a big uh, uh, American uh, corporation with more than 200,000 employees and 50 billion uh, sales. So you see here some other companies uh, in belonging to the same group. Now I would uh, jump into the. the Technical uh, products uh, we, we, we produce. So we do, as I said, uh, or see uh, systems uh, to be employed in, in few uh, set, few application fields uh, like biomass, geothermal, solar thermal, and uh, uh, waste heat recovery. So today I, I'm here to talk about uh, the waste heat recovery application. And we have, uh, uh, let's say, standardized solutions. Uh, up between 500 kilowatt and 5 to 6 megawatt. We have uh, customized solutions where we can achieve uh, up to 10 and 12 megawatt uh, with a single turbine. Uh, as you see here, this is the um, our very typical scope of supply. So we typically do the RC plant only. So we don't do the waste heat of exchangers, uh, but I can tell you something about that also later. So a quick side uh, to the thermodynamic. Uh, I, I, we could spend uh, hours uh, talking about uh, just this slide. I want just to very briefly mention that uh, this is a ranking cycle performed with uh, an organic compound. The ranking cycle is, uh, uh, consists mainly in uh, making, uh, taking a fluid and uh, using an external heat source to evaporate it at a, a high pressure, relatively high pressure, expanding it to a turbine to produce electricity and condensing it uh, uh, into a condenser. Uh, into a condenser. Uh, after that, there is a feed pump uh, to bring back the pressure to the evaporating pressure. So th this is the reactive cycle, and uh, this can be become the traditional uh, water steam cycle when we're using water. Is the Kalina cycle when you use a mixture of water and uh, ammonia, and is an organic reactive cycle if you use uh, uh, organic compound. Uh, I, I, just uh, let's say uh, a couple of notes that distinguish uh, the organic reactive cycle to the others. But then uh, in a, in a coming slide, I will uh, uh, come back again to these differences. So um, thanks to the typical. Uh, thin shape of the equilibrium curve, we do not have the need for superheating, so it makes the system to be uh, uh, more uh, easily, easily managed. And, uh, we do not, uh, the entropy drop across the turbine is much lower than in the traditional uh, water steam or ammonia cycle. So we will see later how these two uh, systems uh, affect the the operational uh, condition of the of the organic system. Uh, another uh, very big uh, uh, difference between the organic uh, reactive cycle and uh, either uh, steam or Kalina 
is that we have uh, an intermediate loop uh, to take the heat from the primary heat source, delivering it uh, to the uh, organic uh, working media. You see, this is a, a very typical and general scheme about uh, describing how we do connect uh, or how we couple to a, to a cement plant. So, as uh, uh, all of you know, there are two main heat sources, the preheater, uh, uh, hot gases, the kiln, uh, the, the filter cooler gases. We, we couple with uh, these heat sources uh, installing uh, either a thermal oil electrical exchanger or a pressurized water exchanger or in certain cases we could also employ a uh, saturated steam heat recovery exchanger uh, where we collect uh, the heat uh, present in the exhaust gas to deliver it uh, to the uh, OC power block which is uh, where we really convert the heat, take this heat uh, and convert it to uh, electrical power. The fact of having uh, uh, an intermediate loop uh, gives us uh, quite a few uh, advantages and namely uh, these are uh, a very easy of control and operation of the system uh, even if big fluctuations on the primary heat source occur, uh, you must imagine, uh, for instance, when you are dealing with a thermal oil loop, this is a liquid media which is uh, being just uh, uh, pumped with a very normal and, and uh, low working pressure pump, and uh, it enters the boiler at a certain temperature. It is heated up, uh, the coffee heat by, the, by exhaust gas, with no uh, change of phase. So it is uh, relatively e easy to control it. So if there is more heat, for instance, a higher uh, temperature of exhaust gas, the thermal oil is uh, just heated a bit more. If there is a, a downturn on the heat source, the heat oil is heated a bit less. But th that is it. So there are no issues on um, properly selecting the right uh, superheating temperature or what is the evaporating pressure, whether the level on the drum is at the right point, at the right point, whether you are uh, maybe risking of uh, working in a dry operation. Also the startup activities are much easier, especially when you're dealing with uh, superheaters at the very high temperatures, where, which must be, uh, let's say, it's a, a quite uh, easier system to be run. In addition to that, uh, being just a liquid, you have a great layout flexibility, so you have not to. You, you can do. You can place the systems uh, where it is more convenient for you, and just bring the uh, hot liquid to the power block, <coughs> which can be located as well where it is more convenient for 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 the plant. Uh, so this uh, makes uh, these advantages uh, makes the system to be definitely uh, automated and unmanned. So uh, there is no. Uh, it's so easy to control that it can be definitely automated. Uh, so this was uh, a note uh, regarding the intermediate loop, which is uh, which can be which brings uh, real uh, relevant advantages to the automation of the system. Now I would uh, uh, talk a bit about uh, the molecular fluid that is used in our sea power plant. So differently to, to water and ammonia. The molecular, uh, the molecular mass of the working fluid is uh, typically maybe uh, around 10 times uh, higher than water. So uh, if you go to the, into the thermodynamics of the systems, uh, what are the consequences of this molecular, uh, high molecular uh, weight? Mainly, uh, this, is, uh, this uh, influences the enthalpy drop across the turbine, which is uh, quite smaller than in steam uh, then it's steam ranking cycle. So what does it mean? I don't know how many of you can directly relate entropy drop to the effect. So entropy drop means uh, lower number of stages, so easier turbine, instead of making 10 or 15 stages, we just make two, three, four stages. Uh, lower turbine peripheral speed, uh, so you can imagine that uh, a steam turbine, uh, depending on the size, depending on the specific uh, technical selection, but uh, let's say it, may, it typically rotates at 10,000 RPM. Uh, thanks to the low entropy drop, uh, we have turbines rotating at 3,000 RPM. So it is uh, on one side uh, mechanically easier to be built, 
on the other side, uh, it can be directly coupled to a two poles generator, so it brings uh, a double advantage. Uh, for a given electric output, a uh, uh, low entropy drop means also high mass flow, which uh, uh, brings advantages in, in designing the turbine. So uh, uh, maybe most of you are not familiar with the turbine designing, but uh, you, you must imagine that uh, managing a bigger flow makes uh, the designing a turbine uh, a much easier job because uh, the, the blades are bigger, the losses uh, of uh, sealing between blades and casing are, are uh, less interesting than the overall uh, turbine efficiency. So just to summarize these technical points, uh, and I'm definitely uh, uh, open to, to talk uh, uh, after the presentation into these details, turbine efficiency for a seed plant uh, start from 80% and may achieve even 90%. In steam plants, uh, typically 80% is uh, an arrival point uh, for the 10 megawatt size uh, plants. We don't have water in the cycle, so there are no corrosion attitudes of the working media. Uh, this makes the system uh, having a long life. And uh, we can set up the plant uh, for a zero water consumption configuration, so uh, avoiding any water management activities and uh, actually uh, potentially employ the plant even where uh, no water is available. So just to really uh, summarize uh, the, this slide in, in four uh, bullet points, so we are saying that uh, with an RC basic public system you get to an automated and an unmanned system, you get good performances and also a part load, you have a long life system and uh, very low operation and maintenance requirements. I will jump now into the three different projects we have in the cement field. Uh, as we will see uh, later on in this presentation, we have uh, uh, some 250 plants employed in various fields. Uh, in heat recovery, we have approximately 25 plants, uh, and specifically in cement, we have three projects. So this was a plant uh, installed uh, at a commission at the end of 2010 at Ita Cimenti. This is a, a 2 megawatt electric plant working uh, for heat recovery only on the um, kiln gas. This is an operation as said that, uh, since the end of 2010 and we have more than 10,000 operating hours. We see here a picture of the uh, Idricob exchanger and uh, a picture of the RC plant. So in this room there is uh, the RC plant, here you see the uh, cooling system, here you see thermal oil and cedar equipment. This is uh, installed in a desertic area. So Water wasn't available at all in that place, so this is a, a real zero water consumption uh, system. This is another project that will be commissioned in the very next uh, weeks or even days, and uh, is uh, the, the client is also in Romania, and here we recover heat from uh, two heat sources. The uh, actually, okay, there are three intercover exchangers two on the kiln gas line, one on the cooler line. And, uh, this is a 4,000 tons per day plant and we are doing in this case uh, up to 4.5 megawatt gross. In this plant uh, witness uh, the great flexibility of our uh, solutions. For instance, uh, mm, we are here using a thermal oil loop to get uh, to recover the heat from the uh, kiln gas lines. Uh, but on the clinker cooler loop, clinker cooler stream, we are using a pressurized water loop, uh, which makes uh, uh, the economics working better and uh, easier. Let's say so. We are using actually uh, three sources with two different media. Uh, just to remark again, RC can be very flexible in managing uh, quite different uh, heat sources. This is another project we have under construction, again for housing in, in Slovakia. This is a 5.5 gross production uh, or seed plant, uh, recovering heat from both uh, heat sources, kiln uh, uh, gas and uh, clinker cooler gas. Uh, this project uh, will set up uh, next year. 
I want to, I, I heard in the previous presentation some numbers about the economics, the ballpark indication, and uh, I definitely uh, agree with uh, what was said before. So to get uh, uh, to, to get an idea of what is the total cost of a weighted recovery system, there are uh, two main specific variables that must be accounted. So size, ambient temperature, like exhaust gas temperature and flows, number of its sources, layout, electric connection, water availability, and, and, and even more. So uh, it is very difficult to provide a, a, a very a straightforward rule to estimate what's the, the, the cost of a system. Though, just to give a very broad ballpark indication, we are here saying uh, a total installed cost could be in the 3,000 euros per uh, kilowatt, plus minus 30%, really, so it is an enormous, very broad uh, range, leading uh, in the very good cases down to 2,000 uh, euros per kilowatt, and in the worst cases uh, up to even 5,000 uh, euros per kilowatt. So there are namely three main drivers which are uh, which must be considered when uh, when uh, analyzing the financials of uh, waste recovery systems uh, as we saw the cost so investment cost uh, obviously electricity value operating hours this is a quite a key factor and the uh, operating and maintenance cost so depending on the country you are on the this may influence definitely the operational cost as well as the value for energy. We, I wanted, I ran just here a very uh, simplified uh, economical analysis, just uh, based on uh, hypothetical numbers, uh, talking about uh, three different uh, scenarios. So let's say, if you go through the numbers, you see that at the very bottom. The payback times that uh, can be expected for such a recovery system are in the range of three years in the very best case, which is uh, uh, maybe not realistic, and uh, up to eight to nine years uh, in the average market conditions. Uh, but even worse, clearly, if you are taking a very small plant in a very low price uh, for energy market, uh, payback will never, will never happen. So this is just to, to tell you, if you have in mind two years payback, my suggestion is just forgive it and, and just uh, change uh, the, the target maybe to five years, which is quite more realistic. I will uh, now uh, broaden the view uh, talking to uh, you about uh, some other uh, projects uh, we have in Italy recovery and to do this I will uh, use this uh, I will talk about this uh, project uh, which is sponsored by the, uh, a European found uh, life so this is uh, a European founder which sponsors uh, industrial innovation project this this project uh, has two main goals one is to realize an integrated plant for fume depuration and uh, uh, heat recovery system. And uh, the second goal is just to, uh, let's say, lobby on the policy makers to put, uh, to, to, to be more uh, focused or, or in any case to, to, to change their um, their vision and the policies uh, to, to, to promote heat recovery systems. So, uh, with regard to the first one, we, we worked uh, and we are, we are doing, uh, we will deliver end of this year, a first uh, project for, uh, this is a 3 megawatt plant for heat recovery from EAF Fournays. Uh, most of you which are in the field of cement may do not know this, this type of uh, system. And this is a uh, melting uh, steel scrap with uh, electricity, making a waste heat uh, stream uh, which is even more tough to be dealt with uh, than cement. So here we are talking 
about uh, daily cycling uh, and fumes between uh, uh, over 1000 degrees C down to 300 every hour and with the dust content more than 50 grams per mm cubic meter very very sticky very corrosive very aggressive and uh, so this is uh, one of the very first projects uh, for heat recovery from this uh, heat source and uh, we have this plant uh, uh, under construction in Germany uh, uh, to recover heat from, from this process the innovative, innovative thing of this plant is that we are using uh, uh, saturated steam as, as heat source uh, instead of the traditional thermal oil way and the uh, OC solution was selected uh, over the other alternatives even if uh, steam is the heat carrier because of the great uh, flexibility uh, managing the, the very part load operations so uh, EAF uh, is really cycling goes to 100% of the load uh, down to 0% of the load every 45 minutes so OC was judged to be the only way to, to, to address this, this mercury being the second goal of this uh, HREII project uh, is uh, to, to let's say, promote uh, uh, heat recovery systems uh, in the EU region. So uh, a very first uh, uh, a very first uh, action that was done was making a preliminary estimation about uh, how much power we can recover in Europe from the main uh, energy intensive industries uh, fields. So here. I present you some results, which I believe can be quite interesting. Also compared to, to some Asian uh, uh, Asian numbers we saw today, in these days. So let's say Europe, and, and in Europe uh, uh, we consider Italy, Germany, France, Spain, UK and Belgium, which counts for 95% of the European production. Uh, we considered uh, the potential power that can be installed in these three business, in this, these three segments. So glass, cement, and steel, and we see that uh, overall we may achieve 600 megawatt install, installable, say, with cement uh, maybe approaching 150 plants. So this is not, uh, uh, I believe, a surprise. So Europe is much smaller than uh, uh, other uh, Eastern countries, and also the, 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 the size of the plants are much smaller, and the rate of uh, and the market growth is is negative so the expectation of installing plants in Europe uh, for cement is is maybe at least one order of magnitude lower than, uh, than uh, in Asia I will talk about uh, I will mention now a couple of reference projects so this is a, a, a 1.3 plant we are running for uh, AGC, which is the worldwide leader manufacturer of uh, float glass. This is, uh, uh, this is in Italy, and for this plant, uh, thanks to the high temperature, we achieved 25% electrical efficiency. This is uh, another plant we have running since quite a few years uh, in, in Austria for heat recovery from refractory production, uh, refractory material production process for a uh, world uh, European leader of, of this. Uh, is a product likely a supplier of your plant, so RHI. This is a one megawatt plant. This is another project we have in, in, in Belgium. This is a three megawatt plant recovering heat from pressurized water in a waste incinerating plant. These plants uh, are just uh, a, a very first site uh, over the more than 250 plants we are running uh, and in under construction worldwide. So take a look to, to these maps and uh, uh, as a witness of uh, how mature our, our, our product so we have quite a few plants uh, running uh, everywhere in the world just very briefly what we do as I said at the beginning we do just our seed plants but we follow all the life cycle of our sea modules. So, uh, from the very R&D activities, fruit selections, uh, fruit dynamic optimization, down to the design of the complete system, especially of the turbine, we, we do our own turbines, and we manufacture in modern terms the turbine, and we assemble the other pieces, uh, sourcing the major components from the suppliers. 
We also take care of uh, after sale services for these machines. All of the all of these uh, projects that you see in this map are remotely connected with our head office, and from that point uh, we can uh, supervise the proper functioning of, of those machines. A, a, a past site was on the our company size, so we are still a small medium company. We had 50 million in over last year, and we are some 170 people working. I want just to, to wrap up my presentation now with uh, considering, let's say, two major uh, points. So, on the technology side, uh, the solution that Turbo and Prata Within Power System offer with the uh, NRC based solution. Uh, gives you easy of integration into existing plant, very low operation and maintenance cost. So basically you don't have to hire new persons unless this is required by the law to run this plant. Because it is very automated and uh, as I said, unmanned operations are achievable, leading uh, overall to profitable uh, plants. So this is, uh, we, we really trust uh, our solution is an optimum solution for industrial users to minimize any effect on, on the primary business in terms of uh, technical effects of the process but in terms of also uh, human resources to be put uh, on a waste economy system. As we saw, we have a uh, quite good experience uh, of the plants installed on the field in energy intensive industries. So it is not, uh, we are not talking about hypothetical systems but we have real system on field. We can provide a customized solution to suit your specific requirements. So if in some cases you have CHP requirements or if you have uh, uh, other specific types of heat sources, we can uh, customize our solution to suit it. We have a, a, an established network of uh, of potential suppliers for the other components that are key in waste heat recovery systems, uh, mainly waste heat recovery exchangers. So uh, we, we can uh, give you contacts, uh, we can help you dealing with, we can uh, help you optimizing the solutions uh, together with these uh, waste heat recovery exchanger suppliers. If you have your, uh, if you uh, prefer a supplier, we can definitely deal with everybody, so we are definitely open to work uh, with uh, any other uh, stakeholder to, to provide an optimum solution. So, uh, just to summarize this point, uh, we, we, we as the board and, and, and as PWPS, uh, we are definitely uh, here to, to help you, and uh, we are definitely sure that if you, if you choose us, we will bring uh, a visit recovery uh, to your company as a success uh, project. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ricardo. Are there any questions from the floor? Yes, right at the He's off. Okay, Peter, go ahead. Damage of your first start, so who else is it by? I have a question on one slide. Uh, you gave um, an information about about a, a partial load. Okay. You said that uh, your uh, solution, I believe it's on slide six. You say that your uh, solution is a uh, very good at partial load, but, but what means very good? <laughs> okay. It means what is the minimum load you can work with and what is the efficiency of the turbine at this minimum load? Okay, so the, the minimum load can be set in the operating system as a, a negative power production, let's say, so you can understand what are the, the captive consumption, so the auxiliary consumption. Measuring these consumptions, you can even set the minimum load as the negative power load. So when you are not producing, uh, we shut down the plant. So this to say that we can go very low. This uh, translated into numbers could be around between 5 and 10 percent, let's say, of the nominal load. What is the efficiency of the turbine at the very minimum load? This is uh, 
it is, let's say, a too broad question to be answered. It really depends on the specific turbine uh, related to the specific fluid. Uh, this gives me the chance to say that we use, uh, and we are using in our history more than between five to ten different working fluids. Uh, generally speaking, uh, since the OC systems, uh, and as you know, uh, have uh, a fewer number of stages than steam turbines, this makes uh, the part load operation or uh, and the physics of the turbine to be easier, let's say. Uh, you, you can think that uh, a steam turbine with uh, 15 stages or 10 stages, when runs at half of the load, uh, is not uh, definitely optimized, especially the last stages uh, may suffer uh, quite uh, inefficient uh, working points. We have just uh, maybe two or three stages, uh, even at part load, uh, the, the working condition of the last stage uh, is not as bad uh, as uh, the very last stage, the, the, the 14th stage of steam, steam turbine. So this is, a, uh, I'm sorry, a general consideration. We shall go into the very fluid dynamic details to, to, to address these points, but uh, let's say, take okay. it as a qualitative uh, indication. Okay, we have some other questions. Please give us your name again. Hi, uh, Shama Batikar from Highway. Uh, okay. Um, Consider a hypothetical situation where the input heat stream is around 400 dBc, where your ORC solution is also a possibility and SRC is also a possibility. And if I were to design the most optimal ORC possible, the most optimal SRC possible, would the performance be comparable, all things being, all things else being equal? And that's one question. Okay, uh, short, give us a short answer because we have a lot of questions. I, I, I really didn't get it. If yeah, you have a perfectly or, or Perfectly designed ORC system and a perfectly, uh, perfectly designed steam system for a 400 uh, degrees centigrade uh, exhaust gas, which is going to be the most efficient. Short answer, because we have lots of questions. This is, uh, let's say, too general, uh, I believe. Okay, it is too general. A question. But, but next, say, next question, please. Yeah, I, We've I, got to move on here. No, you can't answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's impossible to answer that question. You need a lot more detailed information to be able to answer that question. Next question. <laughs> Get your heads together at lunchtime. You can discuss it. You can fight <laughs> about it. Short question, please. Okay. Uh, for a typical project, just uh, in the uh, identical conditions uh, to the conventional and the, uh, your system, ORC, is there any comparison with the capital cost and also the running cost? The second question about the CCHP system. Any experience on the CCHP? Cooling and, uh, yeah. So, uh, the first question, so capital cost, let's say ORC has uh, an additional loop. Uh, instead of direct exchange of working fluid with the heat source, we have a thermal oil, which as so brings uh, automation of the system as an advantage. Clearly, it brings some uh, additional capex as a disadvantage. So this is the, 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 the cost uh, for an automated system. Uh, so one was capex, the other one was... was the running cost. Running cost, uh, let's say, we typically say we are achieving 1% of the capex. Uh, from what I know about steam solutions, and we have here experts, they are typically greater, so let's say at least twice. We, we, let's say, specifically in relation to the operation, uh, one person in total is enough to run our sea based plant. For steam, you need uh, at least 10, maybe more in some uh, less skilled places. Just to be clear, you're saying that your system is cheaper to run than a steam system? Definitely. Okay, next question, please. Okay, so my question is... Uh, Sorry, give us your name and company. Uh, Li from Sinoma. Uh, my question is, uh, what's the overall efficiency of your system? The second question is, uh, you see the, the fracturation of the cooler is uh, very frequently, so if your system can suffer this, uh, these conditions and uh, rise well without any problem. Thank you. So, uh, overall efficiency, this is very general. In best cases, we can achieve 27%. Typical cement cases we achieve uh, twenty percent gross efficiency, twenty one. It depends. It depends on the source. Is that the best? The very, the, the very best that we can achieve is twenty seven. Typically, to to let's say. Uh, and best best results in the cement industry is twenty percent. Around twenty percent, maybe twenty one gross. Yes. And the second part. 
Certainly. Second part that I, I, I recall, yeah, we can definitely very easily deal with any fluctuation in the AQC especially stream, so no problem at all in dealing with that. So we, we, are not, we have not a change, change phase in the boiler, so the thermal oil or pressurized water will just uh, heat up uh, maybe a few degrees C more, we can increase the flow, then all the, 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 the tail regulation happen on the OC power block, which is uh, where we, we are very, we can uh, control it quite easily, thanks to the quite uh, lower volume involved, so we can uh, jump from 0% or let's say from 5% to 110% in, in, in 5 minutes or 10 minutes, so we can definitely address uh, Mercurial behavior. So, so okay, so. next question. There's one over here. Any other questions? There's two just here. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, so goodbye, Akhtar from Hansen Summit UK. Um, Thank you very much for the uh, very informative uh, presentation. You, you, you mentioned in one of the slides that uh, OPEX costs about 1% overall of the uh, CAPEX cost. And you also mentioned that uh, this can be fully automated and run without uh, operation in operators' involvement. That OPEX cost that uh, you put as a, as a rule of thumb, uh, does that mainly involve this uh, uh, term loyal? And, you know, uh, the, is that ongoing cost uh, keep adding into system uh, and losses on that? Yes. So it's the cost of uh, thermal oil? Let's say thermal oil, uh, there are two organic fluids. One is thermal oil, uh, very typically, if properly managed, uh, no thermal oil uh, is uh, lost and uh, up to 1% of the total content per year can be changed but is, we are talking about the invisible cost, maybe uh, a couple of thousand dollars per year working fluid is even, even less so we are talking about fluid wise uh, the cost of replacement is just negligible ok, we have one final question please Shobayashi from Kawasaki maybe as you know, we are a steam turbine supplier and uh, I remember, you know, like uh, half a year or one year ago, uh, they got an inquiry from, not from you, but from the other OLC uh, plant contractor to have or to design steam turbine, and not for water, but for uh, like uh, uh, isopentan, for instance. And at that moment, uh, our engineer was a little bit concerned about the leakage, you know. Uh, this is actually flammable stuff. And if it leaves, then it's uh, very dangerous. Uh, it may have a fire at the moment. And uh, leakage uh, from the ceiling of the turbine is, uh, was a very uh, you know, uh, specific concern from our steam turbine design engineer. And it uh, looks like uh, you are uh, your own uh, 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 steam turbine manufacturer yourself. And uh, my question is, uh, how do you take care about uh, you know, uh, leakage oil from the ceiling on, on your uh, turbine? We have uh, a double mechanical seal with the oil barrier, so and we never experienced the leakage of working fluid uh, from the turbine ceiling and from the plant uh, itself. The, from, from, so, so we don't uh, consider it as really a, a, an issue, so we really never face that. Okay, uh, you've, you've stated that it hasn't been a problem and that you don't see it as a problem. You're going to have to discuss this uh, separately. Just let me ask you very, very quickly, are you using, this, are you using exactly the same uh, organic uh, fluid in all of your cement units? No. So you're changing the organic fluid from... Depending on time. size, depending on heat source temperature, depending on specific circulation. Okay. Actually, we have two fluids uh, which, are you, which we are basically using for these sources. Just a note on this, uh, uh, on the ceiling. So, uh, entropy drop uh, means also speed. In organic system, the speed uh, of, the, of the fluid is very much uh, slower than the steam. Steam uh, is a uh, small molecules, runs very fast, so you are really to take care about ceiling, which, uh, which can be also erosive because of how fast it goes. 
Organic compounds is much easily addressable at this point. Okay, we're definitely going to have to leave it there. Uh, we'd like to thank Ricardo once again for his presentation and for the answers to the questions. Thank you. Thank you.